As you install and expand the network in your home or small office, you will probably purchase a variety of low-cost hardware modules or black boxes that will help you with specific tasks. For example, almost every sophisticated home network or small office has at least one router. Many such networks add a second wireless router or a wireless access point so that wireless equipment can be supported along with traditional wired Ethernet. You may also want to install a print server so that one or more printers is always available for use by all of your computers. You may want to install a file server so that one or more large shared disk drives is always available. Although you could configure some of your computers to host these services, you would then need to leave those computers running all the time. The associated noise, electrical power consumption, heat generation, and management tasks are, however, undesirable. Furthermore, because these computers are susceptible to programming that can teach them new tricks, malevolent hackers and unscrupulous opportunists have polluted the Internet with stinkware, evil software that can corrupt, compromise, and subvert computers that are constantly left running without a lot of supervision. When this stinkware gets into the computers that are used to optimize or control your local network, all kinds of bad things can happen. Eventually, most home office and small office managers conclude that simpler, low-cost, specialized hardware modules are better. All of the popular low-cost hardware modules of this type are designed so that you can talk to them with any popular modern web browser. You will use your web browser to configure these hardware devices for compatibility with one another, with your ISP, with all of the computers in your network, and with the client and server applications that will be needing their services. You will also use your browser to configure an appropriate level of security so that strangers, opportunists, and criminals cannot make unauthorized changes. Each time your network grows, if you purchase an additional new hardware module, it will come with an installation procedure that will try to integrate it into your existing network infrastructure. Look for prominent charts or Read Me First papers for guidance. Generally, these installation procedures are well thought out and more or less automatic, but Unless your network is very basic, you will need to use your browser again to access the built-in web server within your new equipment so that you can teach it some additional details about the other modules and computers that are already present in your network. You may need to browse to the modules you've already configured to teach them about the newcomer. The opposite is true when you retire or delete or replace an existing hardware module. You may need to inform one or more of your other modules of the change. All of this network equipment management can be done from any of the popular browser applications resident on any convenient PC within your local area network. You don't need to use the same browser each time. This browser-based management activity is possible because all of the equipment designers have included some kind of a simple web server inside their network equipment. When you access those web servers, you will see web pages that look very much like those with which you have become familiar out on the Internet. But the services they offer will all be oriented toward configuration and management tasks associated with the equipment on which they reside. In order to communicate with any of these hardware modules, you will need to know its IP address. All of these modules will have one IP address taken from a related group of addresses assigned to your local area network. Usually, these addresses begin with 192.168.0. something or 192.168.1. something. Usually, your primary router will take the first address from those blocks, so most routers can be addressed either as 192.168.0.1 or 192.168.1.1. The IP addresses of your other equipment will follow the same general pattern, 192.168.something.2, 192.168.something.3, 192.168.something.4, etc. Your routers will have two or more IP addresses. Your PCs will refer to the router's local IP address as their default gateway address. In addition to that local IP address, a second IP address will come from a group associated with the upstream or wide area network representing your path to the Internet. Usually, you need only be aware of a single such upstream IP address, and it will be assigned by your ISP to your primary router. In that case, this second IP address is sometimes called the router's remote or internet IP address because it is the internet facing address that the remote internet computers must use to communicate with any of the services or client applications in your network. If your internet service provider uses the popular 
dynamic IP addressing scheme, then this second IP address will change from time to time, especially if you turn your router off for a few hours. Some routers allow your browser to address it for administrative purposes by browsing either to the local IP address or to its remote or internet IP address. If your router accepts administrative connections from both addresses, you should use the local one only. And once you are connected, you should look for menu options to disable router management connections through the remote address so that evil people and evil programs on the internet are excluded. Router management from the internet should only be enabled under brief, carefully monitored emergency situations as requested by authorized technical support personnel, and the password that they must enter in order to gain access should be changed immediately thereafter and never ever used again. As your local area network grows and develops, you will become aware of the general format of the local IP addresses used by all of your equipment because they will all be very similar and each new address will be prominently displayed at some point during each installation procedure. There will also be occasional references to each of your IP addresses thereafter. You should write down a list of these IP addresses, keeping it up to date and locating it in some convenient place for easy reference. When you want to access your router or some other item of network equipment, fire up your favorite browser and browse to it, exactly the way you would browse to any other website or web server. Enter the associated IP address in the address field and press enter or click go. For example, if you are using Microsoft's popular Internet Explorer browser and if your router's, lo router's local IP address is 192.168.0.1, then you would enter information like this. Within a few seconds, you should see a display requesting a username and password. At that point, You'll need to consult the equipment's documentation to learn the proper values. Most equipment expects you to enter a username like admin or administrator. Sometimes you leave this blank. Sometimes it's expected to be root. You'll just have to look it up along with the default password, which you'll have to use the first time. But you'll find prominent menu options with which you should change it to something that's unique to yourself. Thereafter, the original default password will never be needed again, and you can forget it unless your equipment ever gets so messed up that you are forced to consult your documentation again to implement some bizarre procedure, usually involving tiny hardware switches, to reset it back to factory default settings. After accepting your authorized username and password, all of this equipment presents you with menus and options permitting its own management. Usually, these menu choices are simple for anybody that's familiar with basic networking vocabulary and concepts of the sort that you can easily learn from the movies and clips available at AskMrWizard.com. Online, context-sensitive help is generally available from some prominent link, and you can learn a lot by exploring that information. It's also a good idea to have a copy of the printed documentation in hand until you become familiar with the important management options. Study the Internet and Ethernet movies from AskMrWizard.com, compare those concepts with the printed information provided by your vendor, and then proceed with care. Armed with our information, you'll find that it's not very difficult. This video clip, originally made back in 2007, has been updated in 2012. Since that time, most things have remained the same, but a lot of progress has been made in the area of wireless or Wi-Fi equipment. It is now commonplace for the router and wireless access point equipment to be combined into a single box. Be sure to investigate our wireless networking section for more details. In particular, you might want to study our special episode entitled, Setting Up a Wireless Network the Easy Way. We appreciate our many YouTube viewers. However, if you are trying to find our videos only on YouTube, you are missing out on a lot of our very best content. We have thousands of informative video clips like this one, and it can be difficult to find the others in proper sequence. On our site, these clips are also accompanied by related links, related text, still images, audio recordings, question and answer forums, and advertisements from carefully selected vendors that understand these issues and want to help with their products. Please join us there. We appreciate your support. From YouTube, it's easy to find our site. Just click on the prominent link at the beginning of YouTube's descriptive text. Thank you.